Uh, welcome to the today's lecture that uh, would be about precipitation data. Uh, let's start with uh, a short review what we know so far. Last session about precipitation, I talked uh, different uh, ways that we can measure precipitation. I mentioned about point measurement and also remote measurements. In point measurement, we saw that uh, either classic like this one, classic rain gauge is used or tipping bucket rain gauges is used to measure um, precipitation amount in a point. By point, I mean the location that we install this instrument. Uh, and we had remote uh, methods like using radar and satellite uh, data. Uh, either remote or uh, point measurement, we collect some data. And in this lecture, I will talk how we use those data or how we uh, manage those, those data. And uh, let's assume that we have such a point measurements using either flip bucket or, uh, sorry, tipping bucket or uh, classic rain gauge. And uh, based on the data that we collect from them, we divided them into recording or non-recording. You might remom remember that when we say uh, this is a recording gauge, it means that it the gauge uh, provides intensity of rainfall because we know at which duration how much uh, liquid uh, goes th to the instrument. How about when it is not recording, like in classic measurement, like this one, uh, we just know total amount of the water or liquid within the gate. So we cannot uh, uh, provide uh, high resolution intensity. We can say, okay, after, uh, for example, exactly we had far assumed that we had uh, an, uh, a rainfall event with duration of six hours. And if the total amount of uh, uh, water in the gauge uh, is 30 millimeters, we can say that, uh, okay, intensity equals to uh, 30 per six, 30 millimeters per six hours, it equals to what? Five or five millimeter per, uh, per hour. So it gives only the average or mean intensity of entire duration of rainfall event, not uh, high resolution intensity. Uh, anyway, if uh, when we use uh, some instruments to measure, there are some errors that I, uh, you see a list of potential errors of measurements. And one important point is, so we should be careful our measurements does not, uh, do not include errors. If they include errors, we should correct the measurements. Some of the errors are listed here, as you see, instrumental error, errors in scale reading. Instrumental error means some uh, problems with instrument. For example, leakage, maybe we wrote it, leakage in the measuring cylinder, or Errors in scale reading. This is a scale, okay? We have a scale here, and when someone goes to read it, it is possible to read two or three millimeters by mistake, or one millimeter. Therefore, we have such error. Dent in receivers, it could be some dents in the receivers, and therefore it includes some uh, errors in our measurements. And uh, about 0.25 millimeter of water is initially required to wet the surface of the gauge. Yeah, it, this surface should be wet first, then water can move down, and then it is measured. 
So we will lose automatically 0.25 millimeter of rainfall. Rain gate splash from collector. Yeah, it is, for example, when we have, um, when the terminal velocity is high, you remember it could be up to nine millimeter uh, per uh, second. Some uh, uh, part of rainfall can be splashed out and therefore it includes, uh, it makes some errors. Frictional effects uh, in a tipping bucket like this, it could be some frictional problem in the instrument. It is called frictional error. Non-vertically measuring cylinders. You see, as a result of, for example, uh, wind, it is possible that uh, the uh, instrument or the gauge uh, has some uh, angle with the vertical line. Therefore, it includes error. Loss of water by evaporation, yeah. If we have today, for example, rainfall and you don't come to read it, read the scale, and if you come tomorrow or a day after tomorrow, definitely we will lose some of the uh, some of um, water within the uh, gauge due to evaporation. Leakage, it could be, as I told, uh, and also wind speed reduces measure of amount. Wind speed, yeah. For when we have windy day rainfalls, windy and rainy days, it includes some uh, errors to the uh, measurements. So uh, when we collected the data, we should think about potential errors and we should adjust or modify those data. Okay, uh, here I will show you, we assume that we used uh, point measurements and uh, therefore we have a seri uh, series of data a series of precipitation during several years or after one event. How we showed, how we show, how we present these data sets uh, in practice in engineering works. We have two kind of precipita uh, uh, illustration method for precipitation data. The first one is called hyatograph, hyatograph. The second one is time series. Let's uh, start with hyatograph. Hyator, as you see here, hyatograph is a graph that shows intensity of uh, rainfall in, uh, in, uh, in front or against the time. Intensity, you know that. Intensity is, uh, as I told, is the rate of precipitation in by time for for example, uh, uh, and one important point, hydrographs usually are uh, drawn for event, rainfall event. For example, for today, if you have today a rainfall event, it shows uh, for a rainfall event, not for long term uh, data. Let's evaluate this event, what this hydrograph says uh, to us. It's a, uh, it's a hydrograph is a graphical representation of the distribution of rainfall intensity over time. For instance, in the 24 hour rainfall distribution, distributions as developed by the soil, uh, blah, blah, blah. Rainfall intensity progressively increases until it reaches a maximum and then gradually decreases. Yeah, it uh, reflects the physics of the rainfall. Let's check this rainfall event. We assume that we had a rainfall and this hydrograph belongs to that rainfall. What was the duration of this event? It was maybe 160 minutes. 160 minutes divided by uh, 160 minutes or three hours. Assume it is about three hours event. We see that uh, our hydrograph shows the amount of rainfall that we or the catchment receive at each six minutes. For example, at the first six minutes, the uh, amount of precipitation was about, for example, two or three or five millimeters, this one. Then 
we have low intensity for the next six minutes. And then we had uh, an increase intensity of the rainfall. And you see every six minutes up to here, which we are uh, in the uh, minute of, for example, six, uh, 36, we had the maximum intensity of 200 millimeter per hour. Okay, then uh, the intensity of rainfall decreases up to the minute of 78. After that, again, the, the same event, the same rainfall intensity increases to reach the secondary peak, which is about 120 millimeter per second. You see here, we have another peak then increase, then decrease in the intensity. Then we have more or less a, a fix, a constant rate up to the uh, intensity, up to the end of the precipitation. This is called hydrograph. And as uh, I explained, it represents one event. The event of uh, this rainfall was about three hours. However, uh, after these three hours rainfall, at the same gauge, maybe tomorrow we have another rainfall hmm? with four hours, five hours duration. A day after tomorrow, a rainfall. Then two or three days, no rainfall. Then a rainfall. You see several uh, rainfalls. Uh, you know that several rainfall events uh, occur every year mostly in the spring and winter season and with less frequency in summer season. But in entire the year, we might have some rainfall. So uh, if we want to show every rainfall event by hydrograph, we should have, for example, hundreds of hydrograph for a year. Hmm? What we do to, uh, to analyze rainfall events in long terms, some of the uh, total amount of one event, total amount of water of one event, is considered one value. Okay, this event, okay, total, and what is the total amount of one event? We can find to using this hydrograph. And the sum, the total, for example, is 10 centimeter, okay? at that day is considered, uh, at that period, three hour period, it considered one event, but maybe during that day, we had just this event. Therefore, for that day, we have one value. So for every day, we can have one value or the value could be zero. And you therefore, we can generate time series plot like this, time series plot of uh, rainfall events. So, for example, this time series show belongs to the year 2013 and shows that depths of rainfall, depths of total rainfall in the instrument is about, for example, uh, 40 millimeter at this day or at uh, this is first, I guess, or 10 or 20 millimeter at the 1st August, and so other values. When we have time series like this, we can uh, find which day of the year has the most rainfall, the most or the heaviest rainfall. You see, for example, during the uh, sept uh, before September, at the late August, we had maximum rainfall event with the depths of 270 millimeter. And also at late or the middle of July, at the mid, around middle of July, we had uh, another rainy day with the depths of 200 millimeter. So, uh, we have two kind of uh, uh, graphs to illustrate our rainfall, hydrograph and time series plots. 
Okay, as I told, time series shows cumulative amount of rainfall after several events, if we had several events in one day. This is an example of the records of uh, precipitation in uh, uh, Artvin rain gauge station. You see that every rain gauge has a code in, in any country and for the, for example, the year of 2012, the records of daily rainfall at each month written here. This value minus 9999 shows that there was no rainfall. This means that this the day is not a rainy day. Okay, no rainfall. So uh, this is daily uh, daily rainfall measurements, for example. And in this right hand side, you can find monthly rainfall measurements of the uh, Antalya station. This is monthly rainfall measurements. How we can find monthly rainfall? If you have daily rainfall like this, and if you add all the rain of every day together, it gives the amount of rainfall at the monthly scale. For example, at Artvin station, at month two, uh, what what is the uh, monthly rainfall? You should add these values, neglecting the minus nine 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 nine. So it provides you monthly rainfall, and using this monthly rainfall data, you can do so many other analysis that uh, we required in hydrological design. Any question? Okay. So in this slide, I uh, provide you a, an activity for your home, and let's explain the activity. Then you can do it uh, at home. This is an exercise to uh, get warm with working Excel. Actually, you need to uh, use Excel soft uh, package to handle this activity. Using total monthly precipitation from Antalya rain gauge station, you see here, draw monthly and annual precipitation time series, determine the wettest and the driest months of the year, sorry, driest months and wettest and driest year, obtain monthly average for the first 30 years, obtain monthly average for the last 30 years, write a paragraph to compare C and D after you find the average at the first 30 years and the last 30 years, you, sh you should compare what happened, increase, decrease, so you can write a paragraph. And finally, determine and draw long term mean monthly rainfall in Antalya. Okay, what does it mean? Mean month long term means that if someone asks you, uh, okay, you are living in Antalya. Can you tell me what is the amount of uh, or average amount of rainfall during October? The questionnaire does not uh, ask you October of last year or a given year. In general, ask October. There, it is called long term mean, and to for, to uh, find long term mean, you should find the mean of long-term values mean of this for example you should find october for example here and find the mean of the entire month it is called long term mean. okay this is an activity and the file is available in the in on lms you can see the file and do this activity so we talked about point measurements, rain gauges that collected in one point, and uh, you saw that in Artvin station or in Antalya station, we can provide uh, some uh, information as asked in the activity. However, 
uh, rainfall is uh, event is uh, not an event in a single point. When we have a rain, it covers a big area than a single point. For example, it covers your city, it covers a big catchment, a small catchment, a big region or entire country or entire province, okay? So what we need, we need to answer, we need to uh, find aerial rainfall amount, not point. However, we have point values. So there are some methods that using point values, we can find aerial amount. Okay, it is important to have accurate rainfall information in a catchment or city for hydrological assessment. However, rainfall varies in space and it is expensive to install and maintain a very dense rain gauge network to completely cover all the catchments or areas. As a result, only a limited number of gauges are installed and there are large gaps between gauges. For assessing rainfall in a catchment, we need to determine the average rainfall over the catchment so that uh, the total amount of rainfall could be estimated. Here you see, for example, in Ankara province, we have six rain gauge station, six rain gauge station. And as I told, one point measurement or one station just uh, represent what happened around it at the, this point or around it, for example, some place here. Or here we have Nallihan station, and this station represent at Nallihan city, at Beypazarı, at Kızılcahamam, at Asambua airport, at Kichiyoran, or middle uh, of the Ankara. However, however, you see that at southern part of the Ankara, we don't have any rain gauge. As explained here, because uh, each gauge installation and maintenance has lots of cost and we cannot, uh, for example, install uh, so many gauges at different points to, to find what is the amount of rainfall at entire catchment at, or entire state uh, exactly. So what we should do, we can find, we can use some methods based on these point measurements to find average or total rainfall amount at the province. In this part, I will pro, uh, show you how you can find average rainfall for an area with respect to the sum point measurements. Those methods include arithmetic mean, Thyssen polygon method, and isohyital method. Okay, arithmetic mean, Thyssen polygon, and isohyital method. The arithmetic mean is the simplest form that we can use to find average aerial rainfall. This is the, a simple method and can be used when the gauge are uniformly distributed. It is yeah, suggested to use when the gauges are uniformly distributed. What we do, exactly we uh, get the average of the data that we have. How, for example, you see in this figure, you this in this figure, at mo three months of January, February, or March of a given year, for example, I had this value of, for January. Blue bars shows January. The monthly amount of rainfall or total monthly amount of rainfall was uh, 19 millimeter in January. 25 millimeter at Gechi Oran station, 26 millimeter at uh, Nallihan station, about 17 at Beypazarı, 20 millimeter at Asambua, and uh, 16 millimeter at Kızılcahama. So if I ask you what is the average rainfall in Ankara province, what is the average rainfall in Ankara province during the January, 
what you should do, the first and easiest method is to use arithmetic mean. You can add all together and divide by the number of the stations. It gives you gen for January. The same process or procedure can be done for calculating the average uh, rainfall in Ankara for, for example, February and for March. OK, you know this method from basic static statistic knowledge, OK? The second method, which is very and commonly used in engineering applications, is Thyssen polygon method to find aerial rainfall or average aerial rainfall. The Thyssen polygon method assumes that at any point in a catchment, the rainfall is the same as that at the nearest rain gauge. So the depth record at a given gauge is applied out to a distance halfway to the next gauge at in any direction. What does it mean? It means that uh, taking this arithmetic average is not completely correct because each the locations, the locations that closer to uh, one station uh, have uh, the rainfall values that measured at this station. Okay. Let's come back to the previous example and talk from here. In this method, I said that find the average of all and then say, OK, this is the average in the Ankara. But in fact, that average does not really represent the amount of rainfall that we have in this corner of the province. Because these parts, these parts are so far, uh, far from the, this Bepazari station. And when you find the average for the province using Beypazari, Kızılcahamam, maybe most or most probably you the average is not the really average that we have uh, see in here. However, if you increase the weight of measurements at Polatli station, which is so close to the this part or this part, if you increase the weight of this station, the value could be more uh, reasonable because Polatli is so close to this part and maybe the amount of rainfall at here is the same with here. So by giving weight for stations, we can modify the arithmetic mean method. How we can give weight? Thyssen polygon gives weight based on the area or based on the closeness of, closeness of area to one station. OK, this explanation says this. How we do it? For example, here I have a catchment. You see this is my catchment. And I have two gauges. I have two gauges and I want to find aerial average using TSM method. What should I do? At first, I draw this dash blue dash line. I connect, con connect these two points together, two points together. Then I draw a bisectoral line to the dash line. Bisectoral line, it is always perpendicular to this line and divides the distance of AB into the same parts, same parts. OK, so what remains at the left, what remains at the left, the, it is the area, any point in this area is closer, is closer to A then B, and also any point at this part, at right hand side, is closer to B than A. 
Therefore, this area should be multiplied by the uh, should be considered as a weight for measurements at point B, and this area could be considered weight for A. Then if you get the average, then if you get the average or weighted average, it could be more realistic comparing to the simple arithmetic averaging method. Okay, for but sometimes we have, as you saw in, for example, Ankara, we have more than uh, two stations. We have three to four, five, six stations. Now I, I show you an example that we have three stations and I want to use uh, TSM polygon method, TSM polygon method to find the average aerial rainfall. The process is the same that what I did here. First of all, I sh uh, should connect A to B, for example, and divide the area for two parts. Then I can find the uh, divide the area for another two points, two points that shows which part is closer to A in comparison to C. Again, I can I should divide the area, the catchment, to two parts to to find which location, which points are closer to C comparing to B. What should what I uh, how I should do? Let's show here. Okay, this is the first step. I dropped my uh, I connected two points. This is a connection of two other points and two other points. So I have to draw the bisectoral lines for each these uh, lines. For between A and B, yeah, uh, this is the solution, but let me show you in this way. Okay. Okay, this is the middle point, yeah? This is the middle. At first, I should find middle point of A to B. This is middle point. And this is the middle of A to C. And this is the middle of B, C. OK, this is first step. Then I should draw bisectoral line. Bisectoral line is the line that perpendicular to this line and uh, it means that it divides this line for two parts. OK, this is if I assume this is per perpendicular line. And I continue it. Perpendicular like this, for example. However, I do not do not continue up to end because I see that, for example, any point by this by this line, I can say that any point at the left is closer to A not to be any point at the right is closer to be not to a however when i received here any point here for example this point i see that closer to c than a therefore i can stop here this is a assumed perpendicular so then I, so i divided the catchment in two parts based on a and b now i i'm going to divide the catchment in two other parts based on uh, considering two stations A and C, this is the perpendicular line. And I continue up to the end of the catchment, but not up to the end at this side, because you see, uh, now I've, if I'm here, this point is closer to B than A. I can stop here, for example. The last line is BC, and this is, for example, uh, perpendicular line to uh, C. Now I see I, if here I'm here, I am closer to A than C, so I stopped there. But here I can continue up to the end of the catchment. So you see that I divided this catchment into three parts, into three parts.
one part here, the other part here, and the other part here, which I can show it like this. And this, these parts or sections is called T-cent polygons. Each of these is a polygon. And the concept behind this polygon is that any point at this polygon is closer to A than C. Or any point at this polygon is closer to C than A and B. And each point at this polygon is closer to B than A and C. So uh, these the area of these polygons can be used as a weight of averaging. How we should do after dividing the catchment into several polygons, I can use the area of each polygon to find the aerial rainfall. And to find the aerial rainfall, I can use this uh, formula uh, that shows that I multiplied the area of each polygon. I have three polygons in that example. Okay, area of this uh, each polygon to the amount of rainfall at that uh, station. For example, let's say station one, station two, station three, A, B, C. So I have three stations. So here number of N, N should be three. And I can multiply area of station one to the amount of rainfall at the station one and some with the same value at the station at polygon two and add to polygon three and then divide by the a a is total area of the catchment this is called polygon method and as i told it is a very uh, commonly used in practice this is an example you see that here for this example uh, this is my catchment. I have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six stations in this catchment. And I have um, rainfall measure, uh, measured at each catchment during an event, okay? Or during a month. So assume that monthly amount of rainfall or precipitation at each catchment given. And the question asks you, what is the aerial rainfall? that month in this catchment. So you should uh, draw the TSM polygons, and then you can use the formula that I showed in the previous slide to find the area uh, rainfall. You see uh, what uh, I did here, I uh, first I connected each station to the adjacent station, like this, for example, ST1 connected to ST2. Then I derived with this line. Then I divided this line in two uh, sections by this perpendicular line. This is perpendicular. And I didn't follow up to end here. I stopped here. Or if you can follow, then finally you should remove the extra lines. And this figure shows that uh, different colors shows which part of the catchment influence more in the uh, aerial average of this catchment. Or you can say that rainfall at station one should be multiplied at the A1 or station rainfall at station one represent the rainfall at this uh, polygon or rainfall, the amount of rainfall at station four represent the amount average rainfall at this polygon. So this uh, is the TSM method. And you have another activity here, you see another activity. And to draw the TSM polygon, you can use um, either uh, your uh, pen, ruler, and 
uh, find the area with your hand, or you can use some softwares like ArcViewJS or MATLAB. Those softwares uh, draw the TSM polygons, and using those softwares, you can uh, easily manage this activity that asks you to draw TSM polygon for Ankara province and determine aerial average of rainfall for the month of January. Mm -hmm. So this is not compulsory, but if you are interested in this activity, I suggest you go to use of either MATLAB or uh, ArcViewGIS or QGIS software to solve this problem. Any question? No. Good. And the third method to find aerial rainfall is called isohyetal method. This method uses isohyets constructed from the rain gauges by interpolating counter lines between adjacent gauges. Once the isohyet map is constructed, the area between each pair of isohyets within the catchment is multiplied by the average uh, rainfall depths, average rainfall depths of two boundary isohyets. The average rainfall over the whole catchment can be estimated from the weight to the average value. The isohyte method is flexible and the knowledge of the storm pattern can be helped drawing of ISO heights, but a fairly dense network of gauge is needed. To correctly construct the isohyetal map from a complex storm, yeah, they are useful for graphical display of rainfall distribution, but less popular in engineering problems. This method or this explanation says that first, if you have so many number of rain gauges that we generally don't have, Okay, isohyetal method provides you more accurate average, more accurate aerial rainfall comparing to TSEN and arithmetic average. How it works, you know, for these uh, white circles are my rain gauges, and after a, an event, okay, the amount of uh, rainfall are shown on those gauges. The event can be event of total amount of rainfall in a month, for example. I have three centimeter rainfall at these two gauges, four centimeter rainfall here, 4.5 here, five here, six, blah, blah, blah. Each value near to the circle shows the amount of rainfall at that station. So what I should do, I connect those uh, points which have the same rainfall with lines. It is called contours, these contours. You see this line, black line shows uh, is a contour or is an isohyet with having three centimeter rainfall. This counter shows the location of points having four centimeter, five centimeter, and this six centimeter. Each counter shows the location of places that has have the same rainfall, and the uh, num the increasing value is one centimeter here. It could be, for example, two centimeters, three centimeters. This is, you see, for example, if I have eight centimeter rainfall here, here, a, a counter like this shows the locations that I have, that I had eight centimeters of rainfall. So after drawing the counters like this, you need to find the area between each counter. For example, the area between counter three and four equals to 38 square kilometers. Or the area between, or this area, that shows the area which the rainfall is between seven and eight centimeter 
equals 40 square kilometers. So when you have these both information, area between counters and those counters or that shows the uh, amount of rainfall at some places having the same, this is why we say iso heights. Iso heights means same rainfall. Then you can use the uh, this method to find aerial average. What I use, I should multiply the amount, average amount of rainfall to the area that uh, is uh, located between two counters. For example, starting from here, I have this area, this area of 20 square kilometers with a rainfall equal or less than three because this area to down, uh, the rainfall increases. I see it's three, four, five. Therefore, I assume that the rainfall here less than, it could be less than three. You can either multiply it by three or say, for example, 2.5. 2.7, okay? Then the second uh, area is this area, is 38. And the, what is the average rainfall here? It is between the rainfall between three and four. Therefore, I should multiply this area to three and four, 3.5. And, and I can continue up to the end up to the end. For example, here you see, I have a six kilometer area, shows the area that receive eight centimeter rainfall or more than eight. I multiplied by eight and this, this column shows the aerial, aerial precipitation. And if you add all to them together, it gives you uh, aerial rainfall for this catchment. And, and finally, if you divide this value, divide this value with the total sum of the, uh, with the entire area of the catchment, it is, it would be average rainfall. So for this example, average rainfall is about 5.5. And as an activity, you can find average rainfall used for this uh, figure. Please do this also at home. Find the average rainfall by arithmetic mean, the first method. Just add all together and divide by their number. And then find what is the amount of av aerial average rainfall. Maybe it could be around six or around five. But this method gives you more precise answer. Any question? Okay, here you see an example of iso height map that derived for a catchment in Spain. In this figure, you see that uh, the location of rain gauges. Here I have one, two, three, four, five, and six rain gauges I have in this catchment. And based on the uh, value of area, uh, rainfall in this catch catchment, these counter lines already Brown and this counter line shows the location that received the same amount of uh, area, the same amount of rainfall. So, by this method, for you can find the average rainfall for this catchment in Spain. The last today, we have lots of home activities, and this is your. Uh, another home activity, aerial rainfall com uh, computation. Last year I gave it as a, this problem as a midterm exam, but uh, I don't know, it was midterm or uh, an activity with 
uh, high score. So it is important to be able to solve this problem for you. Uh, there are four rain gauges. The location already given by the coordinate and the rainfall amount uh, was given and the question asks you find the average rainfall for the area with all three methods that you have learned. Go to this activity and check your ability that if you can solve it as a simple of the questions that you uh, might have in midterm exam or not. Okay, this is uh, the uh, the end of average rainfall. In the next slide, I'm, I will talk about one way to uh, correct the potential errors in data that we record in rain gauges. But here, let me uh, have 15 minutes break. Then we can continue with double mass curve. OK, any question? OK, stick around and I will see you after 15 minutes.